Okay, so how do I do this? How do I hold my bow without my thumb? It's all a question of balance. Here, let me show you what happens when I play a sound. That's a good sound. Now, I do this with my students. I'm gonna make the same sound, or can I make the same sound, without my index? All right. Can I make the same sound without my index and my little finger? Okay. Can I make that same sound, that same quality of sound, without my index, my little finger, my third finger? What do you think? You see, it's all because of the balance. It's all because of the form. So, does this connect what I'm doing with my right hand with my left hand? Well, of course, because my right hand has to be loose to perform the way I'm asking it to. Same as my left hand. So why don't we go a little deeper? Yeah, even a little deeper. And try to find even more of these connections. Well, speaking about being loose, I believe that, you know, we talk about the wrist being loose. Well, well if it moves from my elbow, then the gesture, it is loose. It looks as though, however it looks as though, I'm moving it from my wrist. But in fact, I'm moving it from my elbow. I leave my fingers free, loose. And it gives the impression that I'm actually doing this when I'm not. So with that, Let's look at the grip a little deeper. You know, I tell my students something. I tell them that in order to be a really good violinist, you need to be able to make at least a hundred different qualities of sound. Well, I also tell them that I believe that one grip produces one quality of sound. Well, if that's the case, how many grips do you think we're going to need? Well, even I can do the math. More than 100. So how am I going to remember 100 different grips? Well, for me, I start with a model, something in the middle. Here. Have a little look closer. See, it's in the middle. A lot of symmetry between my fingers. A little bit more space between my index and my second, second and third closer together, third and fourth a little bit more distance, sort of exactly the distance between my index and my second finger. So understanding this, I now need to organize it a little bit more here. Why don't I show you this? Pressure points between these three fingers, one, two, and three, and the bow. Why don't I start with staccato, for example? Staccato is one and three. Staccato. Now, legato is two and three. Two and three. Two and three. Off the string, sautier is the same. Two and three. Now continuing this exploration, we can spread our fingers and we can get even another quality of sound. Or we could drop our two middle fingers lower get a much deeper sound, or I can pull them up. And I get another quality of sound. Obviously, everything in between produces yet another nuanced sound, nuanced quality of sound. 
And if we explore the movements on the right hand, on the right side, we end up, it sort of mimics a figure eight when I go from, say, the G. Did you see that? That's the top part of a figure eight. Or if I went from the A, that's the bottom part. I talk about this in, in one of the videos. So with all of this information, let's use our scales, our etudes, and our pieces to identify and explore how to use these bow strokes, how to use these qualities of sound. So why don't we start our exploration with Kole, which looks like this, going up, going down, in a scale, we would probably start with either up or down at the frog, like this. That's going up or down. We can also mix them up. We can also try going in the same direction but moving constantly towards the tip. Or we could do a down bow, going towards the tip. Or we could do it down up. Or we could do it from the tip. Going to the frog or the, the opposite way. An etude that deals with Kole effectively is Kreutzer number seven. Now we need to make sure that we're putting the finger down first, placing the bow, and then starting. You see, I already placed my first finger. My second finger is almost ready to go. So is my third. So I'm trying to get things to happen before they happen. So when do we use Kole in a piece or a concerto? Well, let's have a look at Prokofiev's concerto number one in D major, opus 19. Now some people would start it here and move up. I like the idea of starting just here sort of a brushed cole. Really contrasts what came before it. With this. So now let's let's go to legato. Legato. The term literally means that there is no stopping between alternative strokes. It's not with an accent. It is everything very, very legato, very smooth. Obviously, we can do this in a scale. And let's go, we can do this slow by two, three, four, six, eight, twelve, and of course. 
was 24. We can study trying to understand how best not to make the accents through the study of the scale. Now, there are a few etudes that address legato. One of them would be Kaiser number eight. Or don't, opus 37, number three. There are others as well, such as Don't Opus 35, number seven. This one, we have this problem of going between fifths and trying not to keep them from getting very jerky, smooth. Or we have Road, number 11. things, trying to keep it as legato as possible. Now, to explore legato strokes in pieces, there are many choices, but I thought it might be fun to look at the Bach G minor sonata, the opening adagio. Do you see it? through this gives us many opportunities to explore legato. Or let's take a look at Fari Sonata in A major, opus 13, the first movement. Each one of these offers an opportunity to explore what we've been doing. Look at them. See? Or even the other way. So let's talk about the stroke detaché, which means separated. It can be linked to any note, not, not, not linked to a slur. For example, in a scale. Slur. Detaché. At the frog. In the middle. Obviously, we could use the scale, as we just did, to practice that. Now, for an etude, you've got quite an array to choose from. For example, Kaiser number five. Detaché. So why don't we look at the detaché stroke at work in the Bach Gig from the second partita. The one that starts Paganini Caprice 
number 16. Détaché. Détaché. Now, staccato. This literally means detached as well. But, there's a bite to it. All up bow, or all down. For example, let's look at this etude. Kaiser, number 33. You can even do it the other way. Here's another one. Kreutzer, number four. Which, of course, you can do the other way as well. Or, Kreutzer, number 28. I rather like that particular one. There's also Furio. Number three. Which, of course, you can do it the other way as well. Now, you might practice this in a scale. You know, the same way we did the slurs. Say, two notes to a bow. What about in a Paganini Caprice? Or there's Vieton Concerto number five. The literal meaning of the term martile, which is the next stroke we'll discuss, is hammered sort of a percussive on the string stroke produced by an explosive release which is caused by an initial pressure on the string or weight as I like to say. The stroke is more commonly done at the tip so of course you could do it in a scale. Figure out how best to get it to happen. Or you could look at Kaiser number seven or the Moderato. And these are in etudes from road number one or Furio number one. Okay? When I think of pieces, however, there's one piece that really comes into mind, and that's Vioton five in the first movement. Martele. So now let's talk about portato. Portato is the expressive realization from the pulsing of notes joined in a single bow. Like this. It's also called a porte or lure. Of course, you can try this, you can learn how to do this in a scale. 
For example, doing four notes. Six. As this bow stroke is used so much for expressive purposes, there aren't a lot of etudes that specifically address this challenge. And in pieces, it's really a question of taste. Your taste, my taste as to when you would use it. So, the marking that indicates this is usually a slur with a dash, like in Tchaikovsky's concerto in the first movement. It really truly is an interpretive device. Or, look at Debussy. This time he doesn't use a dash. He uses the dot underneath the slur. But again, it's that lure porteo portato. Spiccato is when the hair bounces from the string. So there's another term, which is called soutier. And soutier is when the hair stays on the string, but the stick bounces. So I think you can see there's a speed limit for when one uses the spiccato. And when you want to go faster, we're talking about sautier. Sautier, spiccato. So let's look at Kaiser number 19 for a sautier. I guess if I wanted to do spiccato, I'd have to ratchet it down the speed. Let's look at Mozart's third concerto in the first movement, which Mozart likes to do. It repeats itself, and we can use our spiccato. Another good one for Sautier is found in the first movement of Sending's Suite. Sautier. As there was with Staccato, being able to go separately or down, with Sautier or with Spiccato, there's another stroke as well, which is called a ricochet. Ricochets are in the same direction. It's bouncing. So the bow is thrown on the string and it bounces in the same direction. And this is called a ricochet. Not sure that scales would it really help us here. But hmm, let's have a look at this etude. By Don't, Opus 35, number four. You can even mix them up, such as in Elgar's La Capricieuse. Starting from the string and bringing it off for all ups, but off the string after that. Fuerte. Fuete is another stroke. It's a bow stroke coming from above the string. I teach this observing that you can go this way or this way. Well, the fuete is this way. It's that way. So we're here. Gives a lot of punch 
to an articulation to the beginning of the sound. One place to look at that would be Carmen Fantasy. <laughs> Again, from above the string, that's called the fuete. So, this is my review, my exploration of both strokes. I hope that you can see the connections between how one learns the skill, you know, through a scale, how one practices the newly learned skill through an etude, and how this all connects to the pieces that we perform.